Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show.
let's get into the sermon. Uh, and I'll go ahead and be honest with you. As I, as I get into the sermon, I got, I, I, there's some news about this that I have to get into first. The first part of it is uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, me and Heather, uh, we actually got in a really big fight. Uh, Heather doesn't. She's rolling her eyes. She don't even know what we're fighting about. But we got in this really big fight. It was one of those, one of those uh, drag out, beat you down fights that that I'm sure, guys, every one of y'all that y'all have had because your your wife thinks that she's right, but you know you're right. Uh, and that's the kind of fight that we were having. And and, and I'll go ahead and be honest with you. The fight that we were having is this. I like the standard system of measurement. She likes the metric. (laughs) That's what the fight. Y'all were worried. Like, what is Tracy about to say? Heather was worried uh, about what this fight was. But but she likes the metric system. That that that's her. I am a Texas American. Uh, We're different, Uh, and we like the standard measurements. Uh, That's what I do. So Heather's like, and she and y'all know Heather. She's stubborn. She's hard-headed. She wasn't going to have it any other way because she was like, hey, I'm a teacher. The, the metric system is just, it's, it's easier math to learn. The conversions are so much easier. But in my Texas, keyword, American football-minded self, I'm sitting there thinking, you know what? So this is how I do the math in my head. Uh, so, so the defense intercepts the ball in the end zone they run it back for 100 yards, and the announcers go crazy. Everybody's going crazy. He could go all the way, and they said, he just ran it back for 100 yards. But if you flip that over to the metric system, it's a little different. And this is, you know, so they're saying, oh, he's running it all the way back, and he's running back uh, 94, no, 91.44 meters. That doesn't make no sense. That, that, that doesn't help, uh, uh, but, but, you know, she, she's like the metric system for that. Uh, but as you could tell, as we go through this message today, we're talking about measurements. And, and it's going to be a little bit different, uh, but we're talking about measurements. Uh, and, and just to forewarn you, there is a test at the end. Heather's going to be proctoring it. Uh, we're gonna, no, I'm just joking. Uh, but, but, but seriously, we use measurements in everything that we do. Think about that for a moment. Everything that you do in your life, there's some type of measurement to it. And it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter if you're a male or female. It doesn't matter about your education level. None of that matters. But we still deal with it in some way in every part. Some examples. If you cook, if you follow a recipe, there's some type of measurement there. You're adding different measurements to it. Now, might the measurements in cooking is a little bit different. You might add a pinch of this or a dash of that. Or if you're old school like me and Heather, how we learned to cook was Emerald Lagasse. Bam! You know, that, that might be some of your measurements. Now, if you're a baker, it's a little different. Because if you're a baker, it has to be precise. If they call for a teaspoon and you add a tablespoon, it's off. I've done that. It called for a teaspoon of salt. Tracy added a tablespoon. That made it awful. (laughs) It was terrible, so it's very precise. So there's measurements involved in that. If you drove here this morning, think about it. There's measurements in that drive. You drove a certain amount of miles. That's a measurement. You used a certain amount of gas up. Uh, that's a certain kind of measurement. So you, you deal with all kinds of measurements. If you're a teacher, you pr- are, are in the education area at all, you've probably taught the metric system, which is wrong. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I got to say it. Uh, it. It's wrong, but you probably taught it. You probably taught the standard side of measurement as well. Uh, but even, even outside of math that you teach, everything that the school system does It's in some type of measurement because they're measuring, they're actually measuring the student, you know, how much they grow, the grades, all of that is measurements. And then you get to the the student side. If you're a student, there's, there's measurements in everything you do, even like I said, if it comes down to just your grades. Uh, you know, a lot of the systems are in the, 
you know, the four-point category now. So, you know, a 4.0, but now you can even measure higher than that because of AP courses and everything, honors courses, you can, you can get higher than a 4.0 now. But it's all measurements. Everything we do is measurements. Uh, if you work, you deal with measurements in some way, some fashion, even if it's just your paycheck. Your paycheck is a measurement of your work. Now, that measurement's probably wrong sometimes. <laughs> it is for me, it seems like. Uh, uh, but everything we do has measurements. Uh, if you have hobbies, you deal with measurements. Even if that, the length of that fish or that drive of that golf ball changes, every time you tell that story, <laughs> uh, there's still measurements involved in that. Now, as far as my job, uh, I, I, most of y'all know that I do heating and air just about everything we do deals with measurements, uh, whether it's if we're measuring up a house for a, for a heat load, uh, we look at the square footage of the entire house. That's a measurement. And then beyond that, with the size of the ductwork that has to be for that square footage, and then because you're wanting a certain amount of CFMs, which is airflow out of your vents, all of that is measurements. And then on top of that, there's a lot of cutting and measuring that we have to do. For, for, so, so realistically, every one of my trucks that try at heating and cooling, every one of them has a tape measure in it. Every one of them does because there's always going to be that time you need it. Uh, and I can think back several years ago when I was in the field a lot more in the, on, on the install side of things, I was, I was having to cut some precise metal uh, to fit up underneath the house between two joists. And, 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 and so I was out there cutting, and I had him give me the measurements. And so I go, okay, so go, go give me my measurements. He said, 24 and two small marks. <laughs> I, thought I, I, th I thought I didn't hear him right, so I was like, so, say that again, 24 and two small marks. I was like, no. Okay, so I crawl under the house where he was, and I was like, okay. Uh, show me your two small marks that you're doing. And so we had a lesson on a tape measure because apparently when the teachers did teach him about standard measurements, he wasn't listening. Uh, so we had a lesson underneath the house how to read a tape measure. I was like, okay, so, so, so you have the 16th, you have an eighth, you have quarters, you have halves, and then you have a whole. Okay, I got it. All right, I go back out there. All right, now give me my measurement. Uh, 24 and the two small marks. I was like, are those the sixteenths? Yes, it's 24 and two sixteenths. I was like, no, you're, you're missing it. So now I had to crawl back under there because we had to go over the whole conversion. Okay, so two sixteenths is an eighth. Two eighths is a quarter. Two quarters is a half. Two halves is a whole. All right. And after about three, four, five months, he finally got it. Uh, but, but it, I mean, the measurements, measurements. Uh, we all deal with measurements in some way. Uh, so today we're going to take a bit of a trip, uh, and this trip is going to be kind of complicated sometimes, so you need to hang on. We're going to travel from salvation. We're going to take a stop at faith, and then we're going to finish up with eternity today. Now, as I talk about all those, the, the salvation, faith, and eternity, as we look at that, sometimes we might think that those are miles apart or kilometers if you're one of those weirdos uh, or if you're military clicks. I still don't understand the click thing. Uh, military guys, I'm sure there's a reason behind it, but, uh, but I don't. Uh, but whatever it is, uh, uh, these all, even though they seem miles apart, they're not. They're all part of our walk. And we're going to see that today. We're actually going to pick up uh, in, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 6 through 9. And we're going to have some other scriptures mixed in. We're actually going to talk briefly about some of the scripture right before 1 Peter, uh, the first five verses there. Uh, and then we're going to jump into James a little bit today too. So, so there's going to be some jumping, but not too bad. Uh, but our main scripture today is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And it reads, In all this you greatly rejoice. Now that first part, Hang on to that first part because that's what we're going to talk about in a moment. But in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuous of your faith, of greater worth than gold, 
which perishes even through refined fire by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor. In honor. Remember, that's, that's a key word there. In honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This prayer of the scripture today. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for your promises. Father, I ask that you open the word up to us today. Father, as we, as we dive in and out and through it, Father, lead us and guide us in what you would have to say to us. Not what I have to say, but what you have to say, Father. And again, we thank you, and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So the first thing that we need to notice in the Scripture, that very first part, I said we're going to hit it in a minute, and this is, this is what I'm talking about. In the very first part of verse 6, it says, In all this you greatly rejoice. You greatly rejoice. The first part of First Peter is what he's talking about here. He's talking about, if you, if you go to the first part of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, he talks about salvation there. How, how that's a key part of our lives. How it's a new birth. How it's a living hope. And even an inheritance that we get. Everything we have from the time that we decide to follow Christ. That's what he's talking about there. And then he mentions something else. Then he says, all of this will never perish, spoil, or fade. I mean, that's, that, that alone just, that excites me, the knowing that, that no matter what, it's not going to, the, the salvation that we have, the new birth that we have, the living hope that we have, that inheritance that we have, it's never going to fade. It's never going to spoil. It's never going to go away. It's always going to be there when we accept Christ as our Savior. And all that comes into play as we move through today's verses, and, and especially in verse 6. And I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, I'll be up front today. When, I de- when God decided, I didn't decide. When God decided I was going through 1 Peter, I was, I'm not going to lie, I was scared because I, 1 Peter is a tough, First and Second Peter are just tough books in the Bible. Uh, and that, they're difficult reads because they, they do get so in-depth. And you can go on and on. You can preach a whole sermon series on just the first chapter in First Peter. Uh, it is so chopped with, uh, with chock full of all kinds of information and stuff that we need to know as Christians. Uh, but with that said, verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, and we know that part now, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, as I look at that verse, really, and again, there, there is so much you can pull from this, but there is one main word that really pops out at me as I look at this. The word trials. The word trials. And, and we know when I've talked about this before in, in other sermons, uh, I've always considered trials as, as a time that God teaches us something, He shows us something, or He's wanting to give us something. And as, as I was putting all this together... I actually came to a deeper understanding of this word. Because everyone knows that I love the book of James. Everybody knows that that is my favorite book in the Bible. And at the very beginning of the book, it talks about this word. In James chapter 1, verse 2, it's up on the screen if you need it. Consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. He's talking to us. James is talking to every one of us. If you are a brother and sister in Christ, James is talking to to you here. Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, y'all have heard me. I've preached multiple sermons on this. And, and, And I've read this verse so many times. And I've always thought as of trials as something that that pops up in your life. That they just they they randomly pop up in your life. And through them, God does show us stuff. I, I, I firmly believe that. And that, that's been my only mindset in that. Now, side note here, one thing that we need to keep out of our minds. This is something that you do not need to have in your mind whatsoever. 
is that God puts these trials in your life because we don't measure up. Now, not how he works. He's not going to have you go through a trial in your life because you're doing something wrong. He's not going to put you through a trial in your life because you're just not measuring up to his expectations. That's not how God works when it comes to trials. And as I look and I understand the scripture today, I see trials as an actual part of your salvation. You going through trials in your life is a part of your salvation, a part that will happen in everyone's Christian walk. If you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to go through these times. You're going to go through trials. So yes, as talking about salvation, it is a new birth. It is a living hope. It is an inheritance. But, it's always a but, as we walk by faith, there's going to be trials. It's part of our salvation. Those, those times that we suffer, those times that we hurt, those, those uphill battles that we have sometimes, the heartache, just the genuine tough times that we go through, those times are going to, those times are going to happen. And I've always mentioned this to you since I've, since I've preached the first time in James chapter 1, verse 2. He wants to show us something. He wants to teach us something. He's giving us something. But most of all, he's making us. That's, that's the difference that I saw when I read into 1 Peter here. He's making us. He's building us up. Verse 6 tells us that this is part of our salvation. Trials is part of our salvation. But it's only temporary. We see that in Scripture today. When you go through these time in, times in your life, hey, they're temporary. Now, I'll go ahead and be the first to uh, admit, I don't know the things that you've been through. I don't know the trials that you've been through. And it's difficult to say when you're walking in the midst of those times in your life, it's hard for you to see that they're only temporary because you're right in the middle of it. You're right in the middle of battle, and it's hard to see that they're, this is just temporary. This is just temp temporary. This is just temp temporary. I, I know it might not seem like it, but I assure you, I promise you, your youth pastor is promising you this morning that there is something greater ahead. There is. There's something greater in front of you, so keep walking. That's my encouragement to you. Just keep walking. Keep walking, and we'll see this as we move uh, through the rest of the verses this morning. So with that said, so, so we see the part of salvation that, that has the deal with trials. And now we're going to look at that other word that pops out as, 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 as we read through the entire section, the word faith. The faith comes up, which is also part of your salvation. And we see it in verses 7 and 8, but first verse 7, it says, These have come so that you, so that the proven genuous of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through refined, refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Faith. First part of seven, it actually goes back to that key word in verse six, trials. The trials in our lives, that, that's showing God off. He, he sh we're showing off our faith with these. And, and on a side note, a, a bit of a rabbit trail that I think we do need to go down. Uh, we, don't, we don't get more faith by going through trials. We, we need to make sure that we understand that. We don't get more faith. Faith doesn't just keep adding up the more that we go through something. For some reason, some people think that, that this, is a, this, this is a part of God measuring us up. Uh, it, it's not. Uh, if, if, I, if I just get through those hard times, we think sometimes, I can get more faith, and, and maybe, maybe I'll measure up to God at some point. That, that's the wrong mindset to have. Uh, first of all, God never loves you more than he loves you right now. God loves you, period. Period. He loves you. This, 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 this faith and something else that he tells us in, in verse 7, this faith that we have is stronger than anything that the world can have. 
The faith that we have is stronger than anything in the world. Uh, we see that in verse 7, of greater worth than gold. Gold was, was such a high commodity, and it still is. Uh, and we, think, we automatically think gold being expensive. Same thing then. Uh, it, our faith is worth more than any amount of gold. Why? Because gold perishes. Our faith, it never spoils. It never fades. It never goes away. We heard about that earlier. Our faith is greater. Our faith is greater. It will never perish. It will never spool. It will never fade. And then in verse 8, we have the most perfect picture of faith. What it actually looks like. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, as you're going through those difficult times in your life, as you're going through those battles in your life, even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Two things that we need to notice in that. First thing, we don't see him, but we love him. That's, that's, that's faith. That's having faith in God, even though we don't see him right here in front of me. He's not standing right here beside of me physically. Now, he is spiritually, but physically, somebody is not standing right here. Even though that's not happening, I love him. And then the other part, as we move through life, the good, the bad, the ugly, and we don't see him now, right now, we still believe in him. That's faith. That is a perfect picture of faith. If you ever want to know what faith is, go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. It, it tells you exactly what faith in Christ looks like. And all that said, that's why we have joy. That joy that we read about in, in James, brothers and sisters, you know, all of us have joy, you know, especially when you're going through those tough times. That joy, that's, this is why we have joy, because God is always there. Christ is always there, and it never fades. It never goes away. He's always right there. And, 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 so let me ask you a question this morning. Do you have that joy? Do you have that joy? And if you have that joy, and as we look at, at faith the way that we're looking at it today, how would you actually define that? to somebody how would you explain that to somebody uh, how would you explain it to a friend a loved one that's going through hard times I mean what would you say to them when they're, when they're struggling with that faith because let's be honest another time to be honest this morning we're going to struggle with it Don't, whether you're going through some difficult times uh, hard times some battles in your life our faith is going to be shaken sometimes. What would you say to them? How would you explain it to them? Let your youth pastor tell you how he would explain it to somebody. And it's as simply put as I can. My faith, my faith is having confidence in Christ Jesus. My faith is having confidence in Jesus. And even more than that, my confidence in his ability. Not my ability, his ability. My confidence in his ability to bring me through every circumstance in life. Good or bad. Uphill, downhill, around the hill. He has the ability to get you through anything. That's faith. That's faith. That's how if you were to come to me and, and, and tell me that you're struggling with your faith, that's what I would tell you. I'm telling you right now. Have confidence in Him. Have confidence in His ability. His ability is greater than my ability will ever be. It just is. That's what I would say. And then, and, and then so, so as we look at that, we've seen salvation. That's trials is part of that salvation. Our faith and now eternity. Eternity. This, this is a hard word sometimes. 
and and we've tried to talk about it down in the youth and and and, and I try to make it as clear to them as I can what eternity looks like but it's you can't measure it first of all we talked about it at Sunday school this morning you know when when in the Old Testament in Psalms it talks about uh, from east to west the reason they use that is because it's unmeasurable that's that's his ability. It's unmeasurable. And, and when you're talking about eternity, if, if you put today in, on a time stamp of eternity, if you could do that somehow, you couldn't even see the time stamp. That's how far eternity is. So this word eternity, this is a tough thing sometimes, but we see, we see a picture of it uh, somewhat in verse 9. It says, for you are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, it doesn't come out and exactly say eternity, but if you read between the lines here, it's there. The end result of your faith, now salvation of your souls. See, that's, that's what our joy should be wrapped up in. That's, that's where our joy comes from, is, is the end result of our faith, the salvation of your souls. I told you earlier, better things are ahead. This is what I was talking about because just before these verses, back in verse 4, we read, we talked about it briefly at the beginning, uh, but it reads, the inheritance, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. He's talking about eternity. He's talking about it forever. This is what verse 9 is telling us. So as, we, as we're winding down here, let me, let me share this again, just in case you missed it at the beginning. This is it. This is, this, is, this, is, this is why you've come today to hear this again. And, and this, this is the deal. This is the hard truth. We never measure up. We will never measure up. But we don't have to. We don't have to. What do I mean by that? As followers of Christ... We don't have to measure up because he paid the price. Stop trying to measure up to the world. Stop trying to measure up to what the world says that you should be doing. It says, if I just get, if I can just have this, I'd, be, I'd finally get there. If I, would, if, I would just, if I would just have enough money, I would, I would be there. I'd, I'd have it made. Maybe if I win the lottery, I can have it. I know Miss Scotty, Heather's mom, would always say, and, and she joked about saying it, but, but there's some truth about it. Uh, I know they say that money doesn't buy happiness, but I sure would like to try. Uh, if I could just get that amount, I, I'd, I'd have it. I'd, I'd, I'd measure up to the world. If, if I was just to get married, maybe I'd measure up. If I was to have kids... Maybe I'd measure up. Maybe if my kids were successful, maybe, maybe your whole measurement system is, is tied to your kids, and if my kids are successful, then I would measure up. Because I told you earlier, everything that we do in our lives deals with a measurement. And so it automatically bleeds into our lives, and we try to measure our lives up to the world. You can't do that. Because we, we're never going to measure up. And then, and then we, we, we think about in our minds that because that bleeds into our, our church life, our religious, our religion, our, our Christianity. It bleeds into that. Well, maybe if, I, maybe if I read the Bible enough. Maybe if, I, maybe if I give enough to the church. Maybe I'd measure up to God. Or maybe if I'm in this house, every time that the doors open, maybe I would measure up. Or maybe, maybe if I just do enough for God, I'd finally measure up. I'm going to tell you this morning, you can't. It tells us in Romans, Romans 3.23, it says, For all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, we can't measure up. But we don't have to. 
We don't have to because of Christ. And I know, in my mind, I know that I can't measure up. Me and Heather's actually been reading uh, our, our Bible plan, uh, and we, we've made it through Leviticus, and we're in Numbers, and I realize that I can't measure up. And let me tell you what, if you can make it through Leviticus and Numbers, you've done something, first of all. Uh, but but if, if you read through there, you realize that we don't measure up. We can't. But we don't have to. We don't have to because of what Christ did, because of what I talked about today, because of our salvation, because of our faith, because of eternity. We don't have to measure up. But as we walk through this world, we're going to have those times, those trials that we have to walk through, those times that he wants to make us, those times that he wants to build us up. We have to go through those times. We have to get there. We don't measure up. But we don't have to. As followers of Christ, we don't have to. We don't have to measure up because of the price he paid. Our salvation, our new birth, our living hope, our inheritance. It's ours. But with that comes trials. It's part of our walk. We need to live by faith. We have trials. Now we have to live by faith. And knowing he is here right now. That's a hard thing to do sometimes. Especially when we're going through the difficult times in our life. To know that God is right here, right now. That's what the scripture tells us. That's the message of this book. From New Testament all the way back to Old Testament. It tells us that here. That he's here. He always has been. He always will be. Why would I ever think that he wouldn't be? But it does creep into our minds when our faith gets shaken a little bit. He's here. He's right here, right now. But that's our trip today. Salvation. Faith. Eternity. Because these last two things are kind of personal. They're personal to you. And really, these last two things deals with you and God. So you don't need to worry about the person that's sitting next to you. You don't have to worry about the person sitting in front of you or behind you. You don't have to worry about work. You don't have to worry about what you're going to do for lunch today. You don't have to worry about the work week that sits in front of you. You don't have to worry about the miles you got to drive this week. You don't have to worry about the kilometers you got to go. Right now, what you got to worry about is you and God. First thing, if you are a follower of Christ, here's my message to you stop trying to measure up. You don't have to. Stop trying. Be who God meant for you to be. Just be His. That's your call this morning. If you're a follower of Christ, that's that's your whole call. Those three words. Just be His. Have that talk with them right now. If you've been struggling with the measuring up, have that talk with them right now and and just tell them, Father, I'm tired of trying to measure up. And your word says that I don't have to. Have that talk with them right now. And then the other thing that I would tell others in here because I've thrown around that word salvation a lot today. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're not a follower of His, today can be that day. If you want that salvation, if you want that living hope, if you want that inheritance, today, 
It's simple. It's simple. All you got to do is admit that, you know what? I have messed up. And I need a Savior. You have to admit that. You have to believe in some of the things that I... You have to believe all the things that I've talked about today. But you have to believe on who Christ is. You have to have that faith in Him that He is who He says He is. You have to admit. You have to believe. And then confess. Confess to Him that you want Him into your life. You want Him to take over your life. You want Him to be every part of your life. ABC. It's that simple. I'd encourage you, if that's you today, as your eyes are closed and your head bowed, if this is you today, don't leave today without speaking to Brother Bill, our pastor. Don't to me today. Let's have a talk. Let's talk about it if you're unsure about things, if you have questions, if you have concerns. Hey, let's talk about it. one are you? Are you that follower that is still trying to measure up to the world around us? Are you the one that has never accepted Christ? Which one are you and where are you? Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for our faith. We thank you for eternity. Father, that gives us joy. An inexpressible joy, Father. Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll please stand right where you are.
but uh, as we continue to celebrate and to take up money for uh, Annie Armstrong, uh, we have a video I'd like for y'all to watch. Who's in my family? Yeah, if you looked at a picture of ours, we, we'd certainly look different. Oh, we have two biological children, we have three adopted children. So certainly if you look at a photo, you see brown hair, you see dark skin, you see blonde hair. And certainly we do get weird looks, but the great thing is seeing the Lord work and do things that you never even dreamed possible. The call to adopt came out of intimacy with the Lord, just like our calling to plant this church. I'm the church planting pastor of Refuge Church in the Ortega community of Jacksonville. We've been here about two and a half years. It was a community that was very unreached. And being there, the Lord just began to kind of do something in our heart. We didn't set out to plant a church for foster and adoptive families. It really just happened. The Lord did it. A lot of our church has become people from this community who are fostering or who are adopted. So we share that in common. People are longing for community. And when you add the layer of taking on people and children from difficult places, it's not easy. It's not comfortable. I think the reason they've shown up here, there's a big closet full of diapers and shoes and strollers and car seats. And they see that and they come here to get a need met. Through that, they build a relationship. Next thing we know, they're in our church on a Sunday. And I think about the amount of children who come to our church who, if families didn't say yes to foster care and adoption, uh, those, those children would never hear about Jesus. They'd never hear the gospel. This is the calling that God has for us. And when people give to Annie Armstrong, you're able to support those who are on the front lines of gospel work. And people hear the gospel who would never have a chance to hear the gospel. So when you give to Annie Armstrong, you see that you're <laughs> reaching more people uh, because of, of what you're giving. You can reach a lot of people for Christ. You see that they were a, a family that uh, were foster parents, and then they adopted their foster children. Uh, and that's kind of the way, uh, that's the way God is using them, the way God is using their ministry. Uh, and so God can be used in any situation. And all we have to do is we have to be faithful in our giving and faithful in our prayer for these ministries. And just we should have it in our hearts and our minds, too, that no matter what a person is going through or, or what is happening in the world, that God is able and God wants us to give to help him with that. I mean, he doesn't need our help, but God wants us to give so we can be a part of that ministry and we can reach people for Christ. All right, let's pray for the offering. Remember, you can give through Tithely and you can give uh, online uh, and you can also give here today. So let's go ahead and pray for a blessing for the offering. Lord, I thank you for everything you do. God, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just bless us, dear Father, and God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless the gift and the giver, dear God. And, Lord, I pray, may the offering glorify your name and lift you up. And, Father, I pray, God, that we would uh, just uh, love you and serve you enough, God, and, and love you more and more each and every day. And you would use us, use our money, and use our time, use what we're going through, dear God, to reach others for Christ. I pray you bless the gift and the giver. Thank you, God, for everyone who's given, and thank you, God, for everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Covers me.
and I'm standing up here talking, and y'all are standing up too. I'm like, y'all want to say something? Uh, first of all, I wasn't tripping over that wire. I was just showing you the inconvenience of the metric system, <laughs> how it trips people up. Thank you very much. I am with Tracy on this. First of all, to the Canadian people out there watching, thank you for the metric system. I won't call a worm a centipede because it's the metric system. I just won't do it. I will not call it a centipede. But we're glad to have you all here today, and uh, we just have a few things here to cover. Uh, first of all, uh, the Building Grounds Committee, uh, you will be having a meeting up front today. Uh, it only take a few minutes. That's what I heard. I'm not promising anything. So, you can guess. Uh, Ladies for Christ, uh, you're meeting this Wednesday at 6.30 at the Parsonage. Uh, try to come if you can. I hope you do. Uh, Christians United for Southern Randolph, they're having a community breakfast at First Baptist Church here in Seagrove, March the 23rd, 7 o'clock to 9.30. Cost, I mean, yeah, cost is canned goods donation. All you got to do is bring canned goods and you get a good breakfast. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, I think, in Sunday school that they only wanted four people. Wrong. They want four people from 8 to 9, and they want four people from 9 to 10. So if, you are, if you're willing to sign up, that would be great. Uh, we are planning on passing out the Easter box dinners from Mountain Air on Saturday, March the 23rd. Uh, if you know of someone in need, please let us know, and that is a great ministry. We've done it for, uh, we did it for uh, uh, Thanksgiving, we did it for Christmas, and now we're doing it in Easter and I can tell you from a shadow of a doubt that, that the people who get them are very, very thankful for them and are very grateful. Uh, and so uh, I wish you would uh, think about that. If you know anybody who needs some, please let me or uh, Tracy know. We're more than glad to get them out there or you, you take them yourself. As far as prayer requests, uh, please be in prayer for our shut-ins and others. Uh, who can't be with us, and, and we do pray for them and uh, pray that they can come and be with us again real soon. Uh, pray for an opportunity to invite a friend, a relative, a neighbor to our Easter service on March the, the 31st. Uh, more to come on that. And also pray for the Annie Armstrong uh, North American Mission Offering. That is an offering, a mission that goes toward North American missions. And so that is our neighbor's. That is our friends. That is our family who's going to be reached out. So I ask that you would remember that and uh, that you would give uh, as the Lord leads you to. All right, let's go ahead and cl close in prayer. We are having service tonight, and so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you. We thank you, Father, for everything you have done for us, dear God. Lord, we thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for the gifts that you have given us, Lord God. Lord, Father, I pray, God, that we would be just as giving to you and your ministries as you have been to us, Lord God. And, Father, I do pray for those who are shut in and those who can't be with us, dear God. Lord, I pray you would heal them. I pray you would bless them. And more importantly, God, I pray that you would be with them and remind them, God, daily and every minute of every day that you are by their side, Lord God, and that they are not alone. God, I pray that you help those who are sick among us and who have been sick and are struggling, dear God, to get well, dear God. And remember that you are the great physician. You are the healer. God, you healed our souls first. You healed our souls. We know that for a shadow of a doubt, that you healed our souls. We were lost. We were broken. You saved us. How much more, dear God, could you save and heal our bodies? Father, we love you and thank you for everything you do, dear God. But we know that your will be done. Most importantly, your will be done, Lord God. Father, I pray you would be with us, God, and that you would uh, bless us and use us for your glory, dear God. And Lord, I do pray for the Annie Armstrong uh, mission, dear God. Lord, that our friends and our neighbors and our family will come to know you as their Lord and Savior, dear God. And Lord, that they would, their souls would also be healed. And their souls and their lives would also be, be made whole. God, we love you and thank you and praise you, dear God. And Lord, we thank you for everything you're going to do. We thank you and praise you, dear God, for everything. 
be with us, God, and help us, God, to be a light to a dying, dark world. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.